Welcome back, friends. Our guest today is Dr. Kyoko Hatakeyama of the University of Niigata Prefecture in Niigata, Japan. Dr. Hatakeyama is professor of international relations at the University of Niigata's Graduate School of International Studies and Regional Development. Prior to this position, Dr. Hatakeyama served as research analyst in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. She was also a research fellow at Kansai Gaidai University. Professor Hatakeyama's research interests include Japan's foreign and security policy, international relations in Asia, and international relations theory. One of her recent publications that I recommend reading appeared in the Australian Journal of Politics and History. It was entitled, A Middle Power's Roles in Shaping the East Asian Security Order, an Analysis of Japan's Engagement from a Normative Perspective. Also, please buy a copy of Dr. Hatakeyama's book. Its title is Japan's Evolving Security Policy, Militarization Within a Pacifist Tradition. This is an important book that contains insightful analysis about issues. Oh, there it is. Uh, it contains insightful analysis about issues affecting Japan's security in our time. Also, I suggest following Professor Hatakeyama on Twitter. Her Twitter address is at Kyoko Hat. So I'll spell that out. It's at sign K-Y-O-K-O-H-A-T. Professor Hatakeyama, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much for inviting me. My pleasure. Well, excellent. So to start, I wanted to ask, Prime Minister Kishida has often called for a free and open Indo-Pacific based on the rule of law, not might. He made news on June 10 at the Shangri-La Dialogue Security Summit in Singapore by stating in his remarks, I myself have a strong sense that Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow. Professor, will you please explain to our audience why Taiwan security matters so much to Japan? For those who may be new to this topic, why would a Chinese invasion of Taiwan concern Japan? Okay, so there are a few reasons that Japan really care about the security situation in Taiwan. So first, uh, Japan might be drawn into a war in Taiwan. Uh, Japan had an alliance with the United States and the United States has committed to the security of Taiwan. So if China tries to unify Taiwan by using force, the United States would take action, perhaps. And in that case, we have to cooperate with the United States. Perhaps we are going to disband the self-defense forces to provide at least logistical support for US military action. And if the government uh, regarded the war in Taiwan would affect Japan's survival directly, uh, the government might allow the self-defense forces to fight with China in cooperation with the United States. So in any way, we would be drawn into a war. And second, um, the China might attack US bases in Okinawa directly. So that could be regarded as an attack on Japan. So in that sense, uh, in this case, of course, we would be involved in a war. So Taiwan is very close to Okinawa. Uh, it's only 111 kilometers from Taiwan to Yonakuni Island of Okinawa. And third, Taiwan's militarization after China's seizure would concern us a lot because the safety of sea lanes may be affected. Uh, as you know, Japan uh, depends on maritime route for its trade heavily. So the safety of sea lanes is very important. And also, as I said, Okinawa is very close to Taiwan and also Senkaku Island is close to Taiwan. So the safety of these areas would be jeopardized. And of course, if Taiwan uh, force into the hands of China, 
that means China would get uh, Taiwan's advanced technologies. And China, that means China would get stronger and stronger economically, and also, of course, military. So that is a bit worry for Japan. Prime Minister Kishida did something unheard of for a Japanese prime minister last month. He attended the June 28 through 30 NATO summit in Madrid, Spain, the first for a Japanese prime minister. Dr. Hatakayama, what were Mr. Kishida's reasons for attending the NATO gathering? So actually, uh, it was not a you know, conceivable option for Kishida to decline such invitation because South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, other countries were also invited. So, and anyway, Kishida, by attending the NATO summit, Kishida wanted to attract attention of European states by reminding China's assertive behavior in the region. At the moment, because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most states, especially European states, pay attention to the Ukrainian situation and they are quite preoccupied by the incident. However, Kishida wanted to say, oh, don't forget about China. Don't forget about China's assertiveness in the South China Sea. Okay. And he wanted to also say that if Russia is successful, that means if it's okay to change the status quo by force, China may take action in Asia as well. So that's why, you know, Ukraine today would be, you know, East Asia tomorrow. And so he wanted to ensure the rule of law now by reminding the importance. And also he wanted to show the unity or a strong bond to the world between Japan and NATO countries. So that would work as a deterrence to China. So that is a kind of message to China. Look, Japan has a strong unity and the bond with NATO states. And if China escalate its action, we would respond to that. So that was a great opportunity for Kishida to send a message to the world. So Dr. Hatakayama, your timely book discusses aspects behind Japan's shifting its military posture. Uh, can you speak a bit about this and help us understand the reasons for this? Yeah, thank you very much for asking me about the book. Um, actually, as you know, Japan has shifted its posture, uh, especially in the military field. So Japan, I analyzed Japan's shift by focusing on two points. First is uh, ideas in domestic politics. And the second is um, international law. So during the Cold War period, political parties that argued that you know, the self-defense forces and alliance with the United States are unconstitutional, maintained certain influence uh, by occupying about 30% of the all seats in the national diet. So that showed that Japan's national security was sort of you know, influenced by these opposing policies. However, in the post-Cold War period, the international society started to ex expect Japan to play a more significant role, even in security area. So that is a kind of international norm that all major states need to contribute to peace and stability of the world, militarily, not only economic means, but also military. So the Gulf War crisis is a good example. Japan contributed huge amount of money to the war to support the multinational forces. However, Japan's contribution was not appreciated. And 
rather it was criticized as too late, too little. So Japan learned a lesson that we need to contribute to peace and the stability of the world by dispatching the self-defense forces. So economic contribution that Japan depended uh, during the Cold War era was not good enough. So this idea, or I should say no, entered the Japanese society. And then that localization, I mean the localization between the international norm and domestic, domestic norm of non-use of force, which is symbolized by Article 9, happened. So the anti-militarist idea that anything military is bad declined. And subsequently, the JSP and other left parties lost its influence in domestic politics. So now, if you look at Japanese political parties, almost, you know, all parties, almost all parties have an idea that Japan should make a contribution militarily to peace and the stability of the world. So they think it's okay to dispatch the self-defense forces for military action if it's for world peace. Mm. So they are quite positive. And uh, so, but what I wanted to, what I want to emphasize is they support the idea that Japan make a military contribution, but they believe that contribution should not um, be made beyond self-defense. Mm. So it's because of domestic norm, which is symbolized by Article 9. So we can make a military contribution within the limits imposed by Article 9. Okay. So that contribution should not be beyond self-defense. So now you see, you know, the self-defense forces are training with US forces and other countries' forces, and also they conduct joint exercise, et cetera. And also we provide military support to other countries. So you have an impression that Japan has uh, played a you know, big military role. That is true. But now Japan thinks, Playing a military role is an appropriate behavior in the world as a member of the international society or as a member of the like-minded states, Western group. So that was not, that was, so making a military contribution was, was not an appropriate behavior during the Cold War period. However, that shifted and now Japanese think making a military contribution is an appropriate behavior as a member of the international society. That is what I said. So I would like you to understand Japan's um, military posture from, from this point. Thank you for that. <laughs> so Dr. Hatakiyama, I would be remiss if I did not bring up the tragic news of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's assassination on July 8. What, in your view, are some of the key takeaways of Mr. Abe's passing? So it's a great tragedy. And we lost a great asset to Japan's foreign policy because he elevated Japan's international standing uh, in a great sense, uh, greatly. And also he uh, by proposing the free and open Indo-Pacific concept, he was successful in unifying the countries in the region. So now many countries are keen to cooperate under the concept of free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. So we are very sad. Uh, however, I just want to pay attention to another aspect of the killing. So Kishida and the LDP politicians said, oh, this is against, you know, this is a challenge to democracy. And this is a violence 
against freedom of speech. Uh, however, the murderer killed Abe because of personal grudge, not because of political belief. He said that clearly. But the government emphasized that it is a challenge to democracy. And most Japanese believed, oh, that is a challenge to democracy. And our democracy is tested. But I don't think so. Mm. <laughs> the, you know, the murderer targeted Abe because of the corrupt relationship between the unification, ch unification church and the LDP, and also some politicians in opposition parties. And uh, Unification Church created lots of problems in the past, and it was charged by you know, the police with fraud and that sort of things. So the church is a kind of cult. However, the LDP has maintained close relationship with the church. So their relationship is a kind of give and take relationship. So the government provide a favorable regulation to the church and the church would provide votes to the LDP politicians. So it's a give and take relationship. That is why the government did not ban the church. And the government did not create a uh, kind of regulation that make it difficult to conduct, for them to conduct activities. So, and also media did not report their activities for more than 30 years. So that is why many people do not know that the Unification Church created lots of programs in Japanese societies, many families you know, were forced to donate huge amount of money and they lost fortune, all the money they have. And many families went bankruptcy, bankrupt. And also many families uh, fall into a part because of the lack of the money. Um, so that they are kind of anti-social group. But even though the government uh, provide them with a kind of protection, and uh, a favor. So that is that corrupt relationship is against democracy. But uh, it seems the Kishida government is not interested in, you know, resolve, resolve, resolving this issue. And he actually, you know, uh, tried to dismiss the very problematic relationship by calling it a challenge to democracy. So that is a problem, I think. And I hope that media and uh, at least some politicians try to resolve the issue. Well, thank you for your analysis of that important development. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, I'd like to ask you a question about Niigata. Mm -hmm. um, Niigata is where your university is located. And in Japan, the foods are quite specific to each region of the country. Uh, for those people who may travel to Niigata in the future, myself included, uh, what are some of the well-known foods or dishes that Niigata has? So actually, fish in Niigata is wonderful. Uh, so that means sushi in Niigata is wonderful. So compared to sushi in Tokyo, Sushi in Niigata is much cheaper and more delicious, I think. Also, vegetables and rice are very nice. Um, so generally speaking, food is quite nice and much cheaper than in Tokyo. So when you go to Niigata, you should enjoy sushi and fish and also Mm, you can enjoy, you know, great nature and also hot spring in Niigata. There are many hot springs in Niigata, which is very famous. Um, so it's 
Mm, Niigata does may not have a, a great appeal like Kyoto or like Hokkaido. Uh, however, it has a small attractiveness, lots of small attractiveness. So yes, please visit Niigata. Well, on that lovely note, uh, Professor Hatakeyama, it's been wonderful having you uh, to discuss these important security issues facing Japan and its region. What a great learning opportunity for all of us. And it was great meeting you after having followed your important work after all this uh, long time. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about, you know, very important issues. <laughs>